The motoring journalist LJK Setright and I both find a lot to like about the Triumph TR7, but it's a car that's more or less guaranteed to polarise opinions. The Triumph TR7 was really an excellent car, but the factory was so beset by strikes and shoddy workmanship that its reputation was damaged beyond repair. The Triumph TR7 was a terrible design that nobody wanted to buy. BL blamed the workers and closed down the factory, but it was still a horrible car that nobody liked. So who's right? In this video I'll be driving a TR7 and digging into the archives to find out. In the early 1970s Triumph had a solid track record of making sports cars that sold in respectable volumes, especially in the US market. Its TR series had evolved ever so gradually from the TR2 of the early 1950s, and even the TR6 generation was still resolutely old school with its separate chassis, vestigial fins, shiny chrome and a wooden dashboard. The BMC side of the British Leyland house had had some US export success as well, notably with the Austin Healey 3000 and the MG A and B. People often think of Leyland as a particularly British phenomenon whose products only sold in the home market because of domestic buyers' distrust of foreign cars, but as the 1975 Rider report into the company's future pointed out, the majority of its output was exported at a time when the UK was straight to improve its balance of trade, so export markets like the US were key. At first there were two alternative concepts under consideration for the TR7. The sleek mid-engined hydroelastic suspended ADO21 design from the Austin Design Office, and the Triumph Bullet that looked quite a lot like the Porsche 914 from some angles, but was mechanically conventional under the skin. It was the Triumph Bullet that won out after US dealers threw up their hands at the prospect of all that mechanical complexity. Harris Mann came in as the new head of design, sketched a funky modern wedge shape, and thus appeared the TR7 we know and some of us love. The TR7 was a backwards step from the TR6 in terms of technology. Twin carburetors instead of fuel injection, four cylinders instead of six, a live rear axle instead of independent suspension all round, although it did have a monocoque structure instead of body on frame. This disappointed some reviewers, but rather than willful stupidity this was actually an example of BL's management, in particular engineering chief Spen King, listening to what the market wanted. Not the UK market mind you, but the US, who wanted simple cars that didn't go wrong as often, and when they did you could fix them in your teepee with a tomahawk or something. The Americans got half of what they wanted, it was a more straightforward car and you could make it work with simple tools, although it wasn't so good on the not going wrong in the first place side of things. According to Ian Nichols, writing on the AR Online website, they found this out a few days before the US press launch in January 1975, when the first cars off the Speak production line were in such a state that BLMC's US importer had to call on the Group 44 race team, famous for those Quaker State sponsored E-types and so on, to sort them out. By the time Bob Tullius and the Group 44 people had finished, they'd managed to cobble together 17 working TR7s out of the original 35. Wasn't a good omen. I like the tr 7s styling, I always have since it came out when I was a small boy, and it seemed very modern and chunky in a way that left behind the old world of chrome and fins and obviously terrible aerodynamics, and Joanna Lumley drove one in the new Avengers too. I'll grant you that this edgy wedgy shape is an acquired taste though, particularly those curving slashes in its flanks. The finished car is reasonably faithful to the vision of its designer Harris Mann, although some compromises were made for production, and some of them irk him still, as he told me when I met him at the BL Day in Milton Keynes last year. These headlights were supposed to be more smoothly fared in, and less reminiscent of toilet seats, for example, and the bumper should be a cleaner design as well. When I talked to Harris Mann he pointed out that the US cars had a smooth one-piece rubber bumper that's much closer to his original design. Some people say that the abruptly interrupted roofline of the fixed 
overhead version makes it look like a tank which I think is a bit harsh. The obvious soft top version hadn't been part of the original launch because at a key point in 1971, the US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration issued new rollover roof crush rules, leading to a widely held fear that all soft top cars were likely to be banned. That ban never materialised though, so once the worst flaws in the basic car had been sorted out, the engineers turned their attention to this drop head version, which most people think is a far prettier car. It's certainly very neatly done with this flat rear deck, and it looks great especially in some of the expanded Canley colour range, like this gorgeous shade of Persian aqua. The interior is a really nice piece of design and was well ahead of its time, with a much more mid-80s feel than 1970s. The dashboard and fascia are clear, clean and modern looking without being overstyled. There's bags of room, the seats and driving position are comfortable and the ergonomics work really nicely. It makes contemporary stable mates like the MGB and Triumph Dolomite feel completely archaic. 40 years on, this particular example feels very solid and well screwed together, but that wasn't necessarily a given. They say you can't choose your relations, and when it comes to industrial relations, nobody in their right mind would choose British Leylands. TR7 production at the Speak No. 2 plant in Liverpool was a toxic combination of not being able to build the cars fast enough and throwing them together all too quickly. Because early TR7 production output was so slow, and the falling value of the pound against the dollar made North American exports more and more competitive and profitable, the UK and mainland European launch was postponed several times. But it wasn't all the fault of the shop floor. Around the time of the TR7's launch, the Labour government commissioned its report from Sir Donald Ryder and a panel of industrialist colleagues into the question of what to do about the British Leyland Motor Corporation. It says, We do not subscribe to the view that all the ills of BL can be laid at the door of a strike-prone and work-shy labour force. Ryder pointed to a whole series of issues besides industrial relations. Too much complexity in the product range, too many factories in too many places, warring factions in the BMC Leyland merger aftermath, a dysfunctional management structure, and years of investing far too little in manufacturing technology. The TR7 was simply put into production before it was ready, and there were engineering changes happening while the line was already running. When it was running, that is. All that was needed for evil to befall triumph was for good men to do nothing. And that's exactly what they did. In 1977 and 1978, a series of strikes stopped production of the TR7 entirely. It was the last straw. British Leyland pulled the plug and shut down speak number two transferring production to Canley in Coventry, with the loss of thousands of jobs on Merseyside and several months of output. LJK Setright grumbled that the Americans had kept him waiting while they bought £24 million worth of the new Triumphs, but he did admire its road manners, specifically for its poise and composure, rather than ability to deliver wild hooligan thrills. He said, the TR7 can take winding roads with astonishing speed, in a style so competent as to make very little demand upon the skill of the driver. That was the early speak-built four-speed fixed roof car though. This car that a friend generously lent me is a latish, canly built drop-head car, and I think that makes a good deal of difference. Triumph used the transfer of production from Speak to Canley to make what it described as 200 improvements to the car. Some were cosmetic, like this laurel wreath badge on the bonnet, while others were rather more significant, the biggest probably being the standard fitment of the 5-speed LT77 gearbox, shared with other specialist division cars like the Rover SD1, the Range Rover, and even briefly the Jaguar XJ6. I'm a big fan of this gearbox. It's a little notchy from cold, but once the gear oil has warmed up, it's got a firm, positive action with a smooth and short throw. The ratios in the TR7 are the same as the SD1. That suits the engine's torque curve very well. I'm not generally a big fan of open top cars. I usually find that the cheery novelty of being out in the elements wears off after a while and leaves you feeling you've been hoodwinked into overlooking the attendant rattles, squeaks, extra weight and soggier driving manners. But you know what? The TR7 drop head might just be the car to convert me. For a start, it's actually 20 kilos lighter than the fixed head coupe 
I haven't driven a fixed head to compare, but this certainly feels a very well balanced, enjoyable and impressively solid piece of machinery. The 2 litre engine in the TR7 does a decent enough job. Peak torque is a healthy 119 pound foot at 3,500 rpm, giving it a good amount of mid range shove for overtaking or powering out of bends. It revs quite freely and tops out at 105 brake horsepower at 5,500 rpm, which is ok. The 0-60 miles an hour benchmark takes 9 seconds or so, so it's lively enough to be enjoyable, especially on curving roads where it's all about the fine handling. But to really qualify as a sports car, there's certainly scope for a bit more power. The engine is a bored out version of the 1850 Slant 4 used in the Triumph Dolomite. It's basically the same as the 16 valve Dolomite Sprint engine, but with the 8 valve head from the 1850. That means it's also a close cousin of the engine that Saab put in its 99 and 900 models, which originally featured engines built by Triumph, which raises a couple of questions. There are two obvious ways right there to increase the performance by a healthy margin. Firstly, adding the 16 valve head from the Dolomite Sprint, or secondly, a turbocharger borrowed from Saab. So why didn't they do that? Well, in fact, they did give both of those a go. Works TR7s with sprint engines competed in rallies for a while and were quite handy on tarmac, although they struggled on rougher surfaces. And to meet homologation rules, around 60 road going TR7 sprints were built in two or three batches in 1977. And some still survive, like this one on the TR Drivers Club stand at last year's restoration show at the NEC. Meanwhile, Myra test track records show that they did try at least one turbocharged TR7 as well, though that was on an O-series engine and probably more of a research mule than a serious prototype. The turbocharged O-series engine eventually made production in the MG Maestro and Montego of course, but that wasn't until several years later. There was a third option for putting more of the oomph back into the Triumph, which was to fit the light, compact, cheap and eminently tunable V8 that Rover had adopted from Buick. And that's what they did. The TR8 version and the drop head were launched in the US first in May 1979. As with the fixed head coupe, the European launch of the drop head convertible was almost a year later, in the spring of 1980, and the TR8 never did make it to British showrooms, although a handful of right hand drive cars did somehow escape. According to Spen King, this was more driven by the company's limited ability to produce the V8s and meet the demand in the SD1 and the Range Rover. In October 1981, British Leyland finally turned off the lights on TR7 production which by then had moved to its third factory home in the Solihull plant that had been built to meet the huge demand for Rover SD1s that never quite materialised. But that's a story for another day. The TR7 had a six year run, a couple of years short of the sort of model cycle you might expect. Total sales were around 115,000, it was the best selling TR ever, and roughly a third of those were drop heads like this one. Would it have done better if BL had gone with the alternative, the more sophisticated fuel injected mid engine car? Well we'll never know for sure, but Porsche did do exactly that with the 914 and they sold 118,000 cars over seven years. So pretty much the same. And their six cylinder version was a washout, dropped in 1972 after selling fewer than 3,500 units. In the end though it was partly fashion that finished off the TR7. Traditional rear wheel drive sports cars, open or closed, were a dying breed in Europe by the early 1980s as people turned to the new cool kid in town, the hot hatch. And if you want to see how I got on driving one of my personal favourite examples of the hot hatchback formula, then I recommend you watch this video next. Meanwhile, thanks a lot for watching this one.